you were in the wrong room. Uh, did you think you were in the wrong room when you came in this morning? So we had no tables. <laughs> For the first time in six years, we had a glitch in our registration process. And we had more people registered than we were aware of. So we had to take out some of the tables so that you could all get in. And that's the good news, you're all here. So it, it's worth a, a chance to be here, even if you don't have the tables. So we're happy to have you all here, and glad you could get in. Um, the, today we are doing the second class of a four-class series on Grinnell a century ago uh, with Professor Emeritus of History at Grinnell College, Dan Kaiser. So if you will check your cell phones to make sure they're silenced, turn on your T-coil, We'll turn it over to Dan. Welcome back, Dan. Thank you. Am I uh, making noise? You can hear me back there? Good. Uh, thank you, and, and thank you for coming out. Uh, I was afraid someone had given out the story that I was handing out money this morning. <laughs> but I'm hoping that you're here for, uh, for something else. Uh, you were very, a number of you have been very kind to me about last week. I had a lot of fun doing it. I have to admit, though, I've been out of practice a little bit. I've been retired for a few years now, and I've forgotten how much work this takes. <laughs> <laughs> um, but uh, I have a lot of fun with this, and I hope that you do. You do, too. Um, I want to get going because I, I didn't do very well last time in terms of, of saving time for questions, and I want to do that because... Um, as I said last time, I'm an amateur in these things. There's some things I'm at least supposed to know a lot about. This is something I don't know as much about, and I'm, I'm stepping into particularly difficult waters this morning, I think. And I want to make sure that we have a chance to talk about these things and, and uh, see where we go from there. Um, I, before we go any further, I want to point out this photo that uh, I ran across that uh, I'm, I'm just uh, absolutely, uh, well, thrilled with, I guess. I ran across this on, where else, on the internet, uh, okay? And it uh, claims to be a photo showing some of Grinnell's families having a reunion in Arbor Lake in 1930. And you'll notice that the automobile, I can't quite make out what kind it is, but uh, about 1930 sounds about right to me. And I'm astonished when I think about it, we live in a town which, under most ways of thinking about it, is a very white town. And this photo is a very black photo. I'm, I'm, I can't, I've been in Grinnell 30 some years now, I can't recall a time when I saw so many blacks in one place. And this is a, a gathering of people who were related, some friends from Waterloo and Marshalltown apparently, but uh, they involve some of the people that we're gonna talk about today, and so I was really pleased to, to find the photo. You remember last time I said that part of the deal here is to have some fun. I'm, I'm having fun doing this, I, I hope, hope you do, too. Uh, discovery, kind of like the photo that I just found, I only found it because I was looking for it. Um, and I wouldn't have if I weren't to, of course, and have a reason to do it. And also for perspective, and, and last time we talked about some of the perspective that might have, have come out of, of uh, thinking about Grinnell 100 years ago. You remember we talked about the sounds and the smells of, of Grinnell in 1915 or thereabouts, and the changes that the automobile brought to life in Grinnell. One way of thinking about all this, therefore, is to think about um, what did it mean. Today, uh, maybe not so much fun uh, because of the subject matter that we're talking about, but I want us to think about how the folk who populated Grinnell a century ago saw one another. Uh, and it's difficult to find out. This is the kind of stuff which is very important, I think, in most respects. But it's difficult to find out because we don't very readily leave a record of these thoughts and feelings. Uh, even those things which we feel most strongly, sometimes we neglect to communicate. Or perhaps we're afraid to communicate. And therefore, it's very difficult to piece together the kinds of things which I'm suggesting today we might benefit from looking for. So that's the, the matter we're going to try to get to and see how it, uh, how it goes. One reason to do this, I said it's useful to get some perspective, one reason to do this is to try to put ourselves in the shoes of those people 100 years ago. 
You remember last time I said something about how easy it is to think about the past as stupid. You know, I, I, I can drive my car, I don't even need to use a clutch, right? That's how great it is to drive a car, and, and pretty soon I don't need to drive a car, right? Didn't I, didn't I read the Cadillac or somebody has a car and you just sit in? And, well, uh, those people back there were pretty stupid. And perhaps today, especially in thinking about these rather sensitive issues I want to raise, it's going to be even easier to think about how stupid they were. And yet, I encourage myself and I encourage you to try to think about what it would be like if we were there. How would we have responded to the stimuli and to the people we saw around us? And what does that do for the way that we think about, about the past and those people who, who were there? <clears throat> I was listening to uh, NPR this morning. I got up much earlier than I should have, in part because I was thinking about uh, about this. But when they weren't asking me for money, <laughs> they were talking about uh, Baltimore, and yet another case and of a long line, it seems like, uh, cases of uh, African American. In this case, in Baltimore, an African American who was arrested and put in police van where, so far unexplained, he seems to have seriously injured his spine and a couple of days later died. Um, this is, as you know, a uh, follow-up to Ferguson, Missouri, uh, was it North Charleston, was it South Carolina, video that everyone saw of the man running away and being shot. It matters very deeply, I think, in 21st century America to think about how people of difference, we're going to talk about some of the terms we use to apply to this, how they relate to one another. Now, so far as I know, Brunel a century ago had nothing quite like what we're talking about today. Nothing like uh, police officers shooting people in the back, for example. Nevertheless, when we think about what gives rise to that kind of possibility, uh, we have to think about uh, where, where it comes from. About a month ago, uh, the Washington Post had an article about uh, Portland, Oregon. Some of you may have seen this uh, article. It caught my eye, uh, in part because of this map. I don't know if you can make this map out very well. It's, it's a dot map intended to try to illustrate, um, well, uh, I guess I'll call it racial uh, composition of Portland. And the thing which caught my attention when I first saw this article was it described Portland as the whitest major American city. 76% white, the whitest, okay? <clears throat> and one way to do that, blue in this map illustrates white, and they showed a kind of condensed map which took downtown Portland like that, which is almost all blue, almost all white, in other words. And part of what's happening in Portland, this isn't the same everywhere, of course, but apparently part of what's happening in Portland is young white professionals are moving in, helping to, um, renovate um, deteriorating districts and pushing to the margins African Americans and Hispanics who feel less and less part of the town and who are less and less seen in the center. Uh, it's not all that unusual perhaps, but it's relevant, I think, to think about for uh, Grinnell, in part because Grinnell is and has been practically from the beginning very white very white. Um, the latest data for Grinnell is something north of 90% white. So if Portland at 76% white is the whitest major American city, then think about a town like Grinnell, uh, where the encounter of difference, the encounter of what we call racial or color difference, something like that, the encounter is so unusual. And therefore, uh, perhaps makes, makes it a little harder to think about some of these, uh, some of these things. Anyway, that's, uh, that's what I've been, been thinking about. Maybe that's why I got up so early. Mm -hmm. So what I want to think about is what did race or color mean and feel like in early Grinnell? This is a tough question to solve, and I don't mean to solve it today, but we're going to look for some clues that I think are illustrative. Here's the sort of short course in the event that I bore you very soon, you'll have gotten the whole story. Okay? First of all, early Grinnellians did perceive difference. 
you know, sometimes we talk about being colorblind and so on, and that's a, I think generally said in a kind of positive and an enforcing way. I don't think that's what happened in early Grinnell. Uh, folk there saw the differences. But of course, the most important thing is what do you do about those differences? Once you see them, then what do you do? How do you behave? How do you respond? Uh, and in this, uh, it's a little, uh, a little harder, perhaps. But I will say that it's pretty clear that that difference mattered. Or you can say, well, there was a difference, but it didn't really matter. It did. It mattered. It probably still does matter. I'm not going to be a contemporary affairs uh, person, but it probably uh, still does matter. So that's the short course. If anybody needs to not go up, actually, I could use a nap right now, but I can. <laughs> <clears throat> well, I'm getting myself in deeper and deeper, but I hope to get out very soon. Right? I, it seems like we we can't get very far in this conversation. I've already tried several times to avoid using the word race, and, and I haven't been very successful at it. But it's worth thinking about for a moment. What is race? A lot of people have thought about it and talked about it. And the sort of fundamental question is, is there such a thing as race? Um, you're, uh, many of you are going to be better prepared to deal with this than, than I, and so I'm going to go through this very quickly and hope that uh, I won't damage myself too much. There are a couple of big answers, I guess. And the generally developed, generally accepted answer that's prevailed for quite a while now has been to say that race is a social construct. What the heck does that mean? Well, um, an idea produced by human thought and interaction rather than material fact. An idea produced by human thought and interaction rather than material fact. In other words, it's a kind of a justification, right? It's a way of organizing things, but not necessarily because that's the way they are. Uh, I read quite an interesting article in the Atlantic, a couple years old now, and uh, one of these quotations leapt out at me. Uh, the, the author quotes, race does not need biology, race only requires some good guys with big guns looking for a reason. <laughs> right? I mean, that's one way of thinking about it. That uh, this, this is often said with respect to Christianization, for example, right? Who needs Christianization? The missionary movement in the 19th century was a big deal. Why? Because we had what they don't have. Right? We have what they don't have, and they need it. Yeah, that's right. From our point of view, they need it. So, and that's at grace, you see, those people, this category that I'm describing over here, those people need what I'm going to give them, or arrange for them to have. Um, that, that's, uh, you know, and, and from the point of view of uh, particularly contemporary uh, social science, I guess, contemporary historical studies, that explains stuff like imperialism, too, right? Well, why should I be conquering, why should I, my white face, be conquering these folk with black faces? Uh, well, because of race, and and uh, this this leads to lots of uh, lots of uh, troubles. Nevertheless, there are at least some folk who say, no, no. There really is a biological explanation for race. Now, in the 19th century, this was a lot bigger. They said, well, see, uh, there's different skin color, there's there's different hair, there's a different nose, and so on. All this kind of um, uh, what would you call it? anatomical or, or, or superficial or something uh, markers. Uh, more recently, it's been a little bit uh, different kind of argument, which has uh, relied more upon notions of genetics. That there is, in fact, some sort of stuff, fundamental stuff that goes all the way down to your genes that distinguishes one, one group from another. It's not, uh, I would, from what I know anyway, it's not a dominant position by any means, but it is one of, of some, uh, some importance. Some of you will uh, remember this cover from the journal Nature. It's now, uh, well, it was, I think, 2001. Uh, I remember it around 2001, let's say. And uh, this was the uh, announcing of the sequencing of the human genome. And one of the interesting things about this, uh, this cover, and this was reported in the journal itself, that the cover was designed in order to try to show lots of different colors, types, people, and so on. The, the idea was to have this as the human genome, not just some, let's say, white person's genome, or some black person's genome, but the human genome. 
to embrace all these differences. Why? Uh, well, in part because of um, what's becoming increasingly clear, I guess, is that the greatest part of all, as I understand it, the greatest part of all genetic diversity can be found within any given population. A very small account that separates one group from another. Um, so it's, it's a little difficult to say, well, you know, the genes, uh, the genes made me do it. <laughs> that said, it's nevertheless true that humans, and a lot of animals and so on, are very successful at perceiving difference. Now I have a very homemade uh, example of this, and I want to show you in a moment one that's a little bit better. One of my evening uh, rituals, routines, vocations, I call it when I tell my wife this, one of my vocations is doing the dishes after dinner. And as I stand at the sink and look out into our backyard, we have a little garden out there which I filled with uh, chopped up leaves last, uh, last fall. So it looks, you know, leafy. And when a sparrow lands in that thing, I cannot see it unless it moves. We have a rabbit that likes to come over there because very soon we'll have a number of plants coming up in that and he's keeping attention, paying attention to what's emerging there in that garden. And when that rabbit sits still, I cannot see it. It blends in. So far, I mean, I don't know, I, I don't have the best vision, but I think that's probably not too abnormal. I can't see it. But we have a few cardinals in our backyard, and every once in a while they show up there, and I have no trouble seeing that cardinal. Uh, my eyes snap to it almost instantly. Well, there's something about this which is useful to think about. The Harvard Magazine, a couple of years ago now, had a piece by a Harvard, um, uh, I can't remember, uh, American Studies scholar, I believe she is, Duana Fawile, who reported uh, this idea about changed perception. I don't know, can you read all this back there? Uh, she says, I am an African American, but in parts of Africa, I am white. My race changes as I cross the Atlantic. In France, I say, je suis noir. And they say, oh, okay, Métis, you are mixed. Then I fly another six to seven hours to Senegal and I am white. In the space of a day, I can change from African-American to Métis to, to Bob, I'm going to say, uh, Bola for white European. She says, this is not a joke or something to laugh at or to take lightly. It's the kind of social recognition that even two-year-olds who can barely speak understand. Right, these little kids see her show up, African American, see her show up in Senegal and say, you're different. You're different. The perception of difference is, uh, well, it's, it's there, I think. And it's certainly there in Grinnell. And this is what I want to talk about early Grinnell. I mean, this is all preparatory and so on, so if you want to plug back in again, here we, here we go. <clears throat> Sometimes when we think about the past, uh, remember I said before, it's, it's very easy for us to assume that it was always kind of like it is. We, we, we take our notion of where we are now and project it backward as though it was always like that. I want to point out, and I'm not sure exactly how it is now, but I want to point out that back in the time we're looking at, differences were perceived in Grinnell and made, uh, had important consequences. Those differences were often perceived in exactly and they were often vague, but nevertheless they were there, and they've entered the record, and that's what I want to share with you today, some of those cases where we found them in the record, and then think about what they, what they mean. And as I said before, the bad thing about this uh, long term, I think, is that this perception mattered. Now, uh, I want to show you a case. Remember last time, I think I mentioned this. You were not going to be able to read all this, but I wanted to put it up here so that you could uh, see the text. This comes out of an 1898 publication from the Woodman of America. I think I mentioned this last time, didn't I? I, I don't know a lot about the Woodman of America, but apparently we had a, a group here, Camp Hardy, it was called, it was the local outfit for a time, at least. I know it met in the Elks. They shared space with the Elks here in town and had a similar kind of organization. They had officers and so on, a, a rather elaborate structure. 
I ran across them in the first instance because you could arrange that they provided, uh, I guess you would call it a kind of death benefit, to help pay for your uh, gravestone. And if you wanted their gravestone, you could get one that looked like a tree. Uh, actually, there is a tree. Some of you will know there is a tree, in, uh, a gravestone tree, I guess we'll call it, out here in, in uh, Hazelwood Cemetery. I guess it's not one that's brought from the Woodman of America, but it's very like the Woodman of America. It literally looks like a tree. Uh, I'll show you sometime if you want to see it. I think it's kind of kind of neat. But anyway, the case that we have in front of us here concerns a man by the name of John Lucas. Now, we're going to see John Lucas in, in a moment. So far as anyone in town knew at the time, John Lucas was a black man. Right? But he belonged to the Woodman of America. How did that happen? Well, that's the problem. And uh, it, the case was forwarded up to the Executive Council, the Woodmen of America, and here are some of the main parts of the case. Let me try to get through this as quickly as I can. They called one another neighbor. It was their title to one another, like I, the Masons, how do they call it? But they're names which go with these uh, organizations, right? So each member called one another neighbor. I find this kind of ironic. Neighbor Lucas is a white male. Except that one of his great-grandmothers was a Negress, and another great-grandmother was half-white and half-Negro blood. White, but, you know, not quite. And it suggested, so this is why the case gave that, owing to the colored blood in his veins. Now, they already say he's white, right? But owing to the colored blood in his veins, he was not eligible to membership since the bylaws assert that persons to become members must be white males. Now, can you guess how this is going to work out then? Yeah. Right? He's got uh, at least some Negro blood, and so where is this going to go? Well, it's interesting. Information provided, and this is continuation of the argument, right? Information provided shows that Lucas is an intelligent, honest, and industrious citizen. Uh-oh, where are we going here? That he is engaged in an honorable occupation at the time, I believe Lucas was a barber, and that in his social life, his associations are more with white than with the colored race, although he does not ignore the latter. So we've got this blood, right? And yet, he's a really swell guy, and he hangs with all the right people, right? So how is it gonna go? We find that the great weight of authority is in favor of the rule which holds a person with this small portion of Negro blood to be white within the meaning of this term. Now, I've skipped over. They cited some precedents from legal cases. I'm not going to go into all that. But I think this is a fascinating uh, instance of trying to dope out a really tough term. Race. What the heck does it mean? Well, it's blood. Well, not exactly. It's, you know, who you're with and what kind of person you are. And, uh, well... So they left him in. <coughs> what I find fascinating here is that the Woodman case shows that at least from their point of view, there was such a thing as race. They thought of there being a real difference. And that it was biological, right? This blood business. I mean, whose blood was it? Was it was a great-grandmother's blood was flowing through his veins and been genetic. In some sense, they were thinking about that. At the same time, they imply that race is social. Lucas, you see, is intelligent, honest, and industrious. We're going to see shortly that these are all the kinds of terms that apply to white people. And more than that, he behaves as if he were white. Right? Well, um, hard to know. I, I found no other commentary on this. It was a you know, a private organization, so on. I don't know who spread the word about this or what impact it had, but it's, it's, uh, it, it poses, it, it, what do I want to say? It gives rise to thought. Um, there's another case, this, uh, this was an uh, article which appeared on the front page of the Grinnell Herald on the 1st of January, 1907. Now, the Grinnell Herald at that time, like a lot of papers, had to fill the pages. And they didn't always generate what they put in there, but they chose what they put in there. So I don't know whether this was authored locally or whether they found this somewhere else and repackaged it and put it into the paper. 
But uh, front page, they decided to talk about uh, Caucasian and Negro. Thought we'd sort of line these up and think about them a little bit. <coughs> In this piece, we read, and Grinnell readers read too, of course, that race has intellectual and behavioral consequences. In other words, I'm going to show you some of these cases. It mattered. It mattered whether or not you were Caucasian, as they called it, or Negro. And how did it, how did it matter? Well, there's uh, several uh, lines, paragraph, more than a paragraph, outlining characteristics of a Caucasian. What, what is such a person? Well, he or she has well-developed subjective faculties. Uh, I don't really even know what that means, but anyway, <laughs> that, that's what it said, right? This part I know. Dominant, domineering, possessed of determination, willpower, self-control, self-government. You know. <laughs> right? That's what that's all about. Because yes, Caucasians have that. High development of ethical and aesthetic faculties and great reasoning powers. I'm showing you some of these great reasoning powers of what I'm writing at this very moment, right? <clears throat> so that's what it means be Caucasian. What about Negro? Well, uh, the paragraph begins by saying there's a direct contrast by reason of the Negro's lack of these powers. Right? Everything that was plus over here is minus here. The Negro, the article asserts, is primarily affectionate, immensely emotional, then sensual and passionate. Loves outward show and ostentation, has undeveloped artistic power, is deficient in judgment, and imitative. The front page of the paper. Now again, uh, we, we're sitting here a century later. We're looking back at, at what was said about folk at that said to folk at that time. It's it's a little hard to impute, but. They were living in a different environment than we are, and they're reading this stuff against a different context. Who knows, some of these readers would have been part of the, the Woodman of America case, right? They would have already been through some of these, oh yeah, I kind of see how that is going, you know what I mean? We listen to that background noise that's part of our intellectual experience. And these folk were listening to a little bit different uh, background. But uh, it's, it's striking, nevertheless, to, to see. What this, um, what this indicates, it seems to me, uh, is that this assertion of this fundamental opposition is that the paper asserted a, a radical difference that was ascribed to race. Now, you know, uh, you know that I've been on a college faculty and so on, and I can tell you that it's easy to get a bunch of faculty together and ask them who's really good in the faculty and the college and who's really not. If, if you belong to the faculty, you can say, well, all administrators are terrible, right? <laughs> all faculty are really good. <laughs> so we have this kind of binary that they're uh, trying to establish by categorizing people around race. All Caucasians are really good people, Negroes not so much. <clears throat> and it asserts a hierarchy. That is to say, it's not just you're different, but one's better than the other. And that better one is me, you know, uh, and, and not you, and that has an implication for, for, uh, for what we do. So, let's uh, talk about perceptions and realities of race and ethnicity in early, you know. It's not easy to get at this. Where do you get the measurement? If we had maybe videos or something, we could try to get all this. We had interviews with lots of people and so on. Hard to come by. One way to do this is to look at census data. It's already kind of a problem, though, because the census people are some of the ones who took the categorical race. Often shows up in the census as race or color. You pick right? race or color. Nevertheless, there, there's another category of some usefulness we might think about, and that is whether or not you're foreign born. And in this era, late 19th, early 20th century, the census takers were very interested in, in this because there were a lot of people who were immigrating to the United States. A large percentage of the 19th century especially, 
and uh, up into the 20th, but by the early 20th, well, it begins, I suppose, with the Chinese Exclusion Act of 1882 and then continues a more restrictive form of, of uh, legislation governing immigration that gradually cut off the flow. But, uh, you know, up around 1900, so on, it was essentially un, unrestrained, except for Asia, which uh, has a whole other uh, not so happy explanation. So we're going to look at the foreign born, and then also how color shows up in these measurements. Uh, what do we know about color in Brunel, and, and where does it go? Where does it go from there? Uh, let's just go a little bit uh, further here, and we'll, we'll take our break once I get to a reasonable stopping point here. 1895, uh, Brunel census uh, categorized some as foreign-born. Who were they? In 1895, something like 6.5% uh, of Brunel's population uh, admitted to being foreign-born. There were many more who were the children of foreign-born. That is to say, their parents had emigrated the preceding uh, generation. But about 6.5% themselves had not been born here. They'd come from somewhere else and had moved here um, after their... And, and they were fairly well distributed among the wards. The fourth ward had the largest number, but the others were, were rather close. And there was no place where you could say, well, that's where all the foreigners live. They were distributed throughout, uh, throughout the town. They came from 17 countries, at least that were itemized in the census, mostly Canadians and Northern Europeans. I was a little surprised at this, that Canada should be the winner, so to speak, in this list, but uh, so it is. Ireland, Germany, England, not so surprising, perhaps. It goes on down, uh, on down the list. Not so surprising is that most of these foreign-born were white. Um, one instance of China, a man who, uh, this is Phil's theory effect, I guess, ran a laundry, right? Uh, the, the one from Turkey was actually a missionary's uh, son, if I recall correctly, and two from India, so it's still, you know, uh, the, the immigration wave was largely coming out of northern Europe, largely white, into a town that was largely white. One of those persons who came in this wave that we're talking about is a rather well-known Brunelian, Robert Coots, I think you say it, pronounce it that way, um, who is, uh, well, the uh, church across the way here, the Methodist church, who did the stonework for that church, the high school who made the stonework, uh, he, he laid the bricks for Ricker House on North Broad, a tremendously active uh, contractor and mason here in town, and a very successful one. Uh, Coots, as you see here, was born actually in Scotland, Aberdeenshire, and he had entered the United States, had come to Iowa shortly after uh, he entered Canada in 1874. He lived for a while down in York, and married a woman down there in 1885, moved to Grinnell, and built himself a house. By the time I'm going to show you this house in a moment. He was very powerful here. Uh, as I say, he was the president of Grinnell Brick and Tile, part owner of Grinnell Stone Company, and so on. He had eight children and lived in this house. Some of you will have seen this house, right? 1202 Hamilton? Yes. It's a fine brick, uh, brick house. Yep. I looked it up. According to the current assessor's records, it's about 2,400 square feet. Now, I don't know. I don't see any obvious additions here, but something like that. It's a pretty big house. But, you know, eight people, you know, okay. Need the, need the space for it. A fine, a fine house. And as I say, Coots had quite a good reputation. Many of you will have run across uh, Leonard uh, Parker's history of Powell Street County. And within that uh, history, he includes lots of, of biographies, of biographies of businesses and so on, but also of individuals. And one of the individuals he talks about is Coots, and I, I thought it was kind of interesting. He said that uh, Mr. Coots has attained a reputation for excellence of his work and straightforward business methods, which, you know, he, he was successful, he must have been doing something, right? He owes his success to indefatigable perseverance and industry, traits inherited from a long line of worthy ancestry. Maybe if you're Scots, you know that, but... Um, <laughs> it's a funny way to explain it, I think. But maybe a natural way, or not natural, uh, uh, an easy way, given the circumstances and the time. That this, this was no accident. Kutz, was, yeah, no, sure, he was very successful, but it was not accidental. It derived in part from his ancestry. 
And that's how we got to where, to where we are. The 1915 Grinnell census uh, finds a few more foreign-born, almost 8% of the population counted as uh, foreign-born. It's a little bit difficult to work, I'll show you some of this uh, a little bit later, to work with the 1915 census. It was done on cards. I didn't use the cards themselves. They have since been order, organized and then microfilmed and then digitized. In the middle of all those processes, a few cards were sent back and forth, a few were lost and so on. So it's not a, a, a full record in any sense of words, so we're really looking only at approximations. But uh, let's, let's look at it very quickly and then we'll, we'll take our, uh, our break. Still mostly Canadian and Northern European. England had uh, evidently proven less hospitable and more and more English showed up in, in Grinnell. England, Germany, Ireland, and then back to Canada, Norway. Scotland, so it's still this, this largely uh, Northern European and largely white population still. Uh, one from China, one Cuban, I thought very interesting and surprising, one from Turkey, seven from Russia. It's an interesting case. Um, some of you may know the Berman family. Uh, Daniel Berman was the sort of Zion of the family. They had moved from Russia, Jews who had fled Russia. There were two others who were actually German Russians who had ended up in Grinnell. One became a gardener here in town, very well known, but a kind of unusual case. Uh, briefly, let's look at one of the people who came in this wave uh, to Grinnell, Edward Sheva. The, the name may be familiar to those of you who were uh, connected with college in one way or another, uh, because Sheva uh, turned out to be a very well-known organist and professor of music. He was born in Germany and came to the United States in 1890. Only came to Grinnell in 1906, uh, but established uh, quite a reputation here. Uh, this is a photograph of him from uh, the college uh, yearbook. He died in rather uh, horrible kind of circumstance. He had a place evidently in Colorado where he was out shoveling snow, a late spring snowstorm. Uh, led to his being hospitalized and he died very soon thereafter. Sheva lived in this house on High Street. 914 high. <clears throat> there were a whole cluster of college folk, many of them, uh, in fact, immigrants in the United States who lived there. Edward Steiner lived across the street in a building that's now uh, been, uh, leveled and destroyed and so on. But it's a, it's a quite a lovely house. The, uh, according to the latest record of the assessor, it's about 1,700 square feet. I don't know if it was just that much at the, at the time, but uh, perhaps very close to that. Uh, Sheva and his wife lived there. Uh, for, uh, for a number of years. <clears throat> After Sheva's death, this kind of uh, surprising uh, death that I mentioned a moment ago, there was a lot written about him, of course. And uh, this is uh, from one of the obituaries, and uh, again, I, I, I hope somebody writes this about me. Somebody write this down. <laughs> Dan, Dan wants this in his obituary. The magnitude of his genius is greater than any of us who are associated with him yet realize, right? So, <laughs> certainly don't realize it, so it's okay to say it. A great teacher, a great organist, and a great, you can leave that part out. Organist and great composer. Well, he was, he was, he was really great. I don't know if he was that great, but uh, still, that's, that's the way at least he was uh, understood and perceived at the time. So, being foreign-born in early Grinnell, what did it mean? Despite difference, being foreign-born did not necessarily undermine regard so long as you were white. Let's take a break. <laughs> Just a brief announcement. Uh, I wanted those of you who uh, were here for Sarah Purcell's talk on uh, the death of Lincoln, uh, Drake Community Library now has a copy of both of the books that Sarah um, talked about. One, uh, Lincoln's Body, A Cultural History by Richard Reitman Fox and Morning Lincoln by Martha Hodes. So they're both here in the library. Actually, I have one of them, but <laughs> they're both here in the library. <laughs> Oh.
Okay, are we all one back on? Uh, still hear me back there? Okay. So, um, we were talking just before the break about the foreign war in 1915, and one of the things that's interesting is that, uh, I, I repeat that the 1915 census is not an ideal document because of things which seem to have been lost over time, so I don't know whether this is a, an absolute uh, number or not, but certainly if you go through the records as they survived, you can find evidence of 12 Mexicans. Uh, 1895, there were no such uh, records, so it represented kind of a change, and, and uh, it was of some interest, and it was a surprise to me. I, I, I should have known it, I suppose, but it was a surprise. That the 1915 uh, record shows uh, these folk, um, identifies them, uh, only one real family, most of the others were living alone. Um, Frank Fields, is a, Turns out to have a very interesting history. If we have time, we can talk about that uh, later. He spends much of his time in the United States in the penitentiary in Fort Madison. So <laughs> he, did, he didn't have a long-term impact on, on Grinnell's history. Um, but uh, by uh, 1920 or so, there were still more. And again, the number is not firm because I'm looking at the 1920 U.S. Census. Did not, in fact go very far to try to find all the Mexicans. As you'll see in a moment, some of them were going to be hard to find. Uh, so, uh, I don't know, but somewhere around 40 Mexicans were living uh, in Grinnell somewhere around uh, 1920. Some show up in the 1920 um, city directory, uh, some in the, in the census. Most of these people came here because of the railroad. And most of them worked as what are called section hands for the railroad. They were uh, stationed here in order to mend the track and do other things that had to be, uh, had to be done in town. Uh, so their work was what, in, and I, I said before, I know a lot more about Russianism. This is the kind of work that would be called in, in Russian, that's the dark work. It's the work that's, that's safe for people to do hard and then you get dirty doing. All right? It's not the high, high end, and certainly not white collar, uh, white collar work. Several others also worked as firemen for Iowa Light, Heat, and Power. I'm sure these were also so-called dark jobs. Uh, these were the kinds of jobs you worked hard at and you got dirty at, but didn't necessarily uh, get rich at. Some of these Mexicans actually bumped in railroad cars. <clears throat> now, I said before that the 1920 census didn't find everybody. This is part of the reason why. There was a, a I don't know, is it still survived? It, was, it used to be anyway, a railroad siding right around East Street. And on that siding, there were a series of uh, boxcars which were converted into homes, so to speak. Uh, they show up from time to time in the news. Uh, terrible things happen there from time to time. But that's where some of these people uh, lived, including the ones uh, that show up on this list here. Some other Mexicans lived in uh, an area which was called Kearney Row. It was built uh, somewhere around 1900. Where are we? Uh, so this is State Street, right? Here's First Avenue, Second Avenue. All right, so here's the railroad. We're just a couple blocks away from where we are. Do you, you know where I'm talking about now? Um, in other words, the Mayflower is across here, right? The, the health center is uh, down here, I guess, somewhere. Uh, Carney Row. Uh, there are a bunch of houses that are still here now, and I'm going to talk about a couple of these in particular. But three of these houses, uh, they're all, you can see, rather uh, small and were built according to specs. Carney apparently was behind and ran a lumber yard, and he had a way to you know, develop, make a little bit of money by building these houses. But they came to be residences of the, several of the Mexican families. This one is 624, and as you can tell, when I took this picture in 2013, it was being uh, redone, vinyl siding, so they weren't quite done, you can see the, the top here. Uh, but you get the idea, if you look at them, they're interesting houses to look at, if you've not been down there, take a look sometime. Uh, they remind me, I used to play Monopoly. Uh, I don't know. <laughs> and you remember, the, you get those uh, hotels and so on, they were kind of skinny, a little straight up, but, but not very big, uh, kind of what, uh, kind of what we had. Uh, here. In 1915, Doris Petar, his wife Apollonia, a uh, sister, I think, Maria, and their children, Petra and Earl, lived here. Are you keeping count of that? I think that was five uh, people. In 1920, Corinio uh, and Paula Flores and their uh, 
exporter, Daniel Hakoa, lived here. The uh, recent uh, assessor's report describes this as about a little over 900 square, square feet. Um, not a big house, uh, although putting five people in. Do you remember we were talking about Coots having 2,400 for his eight? Uh, this is a little bit tighter, uh, tighter fit. Just next door is 628th Street, where in 1920, the, the Frank, they called him, uh, Espinoza family lived along with two boarders. Frank es I'm sorry? What's with the windows? <coughs> no, what? That's the north side. Uh -huh. Why? I, I don't know why they didn't put windows, but this is the north side. You see, it's... They, they were smart in those days. <laughs> <laughs> Tommy says they were smart in those days. I don't know. <laughs> but, but it is true that there were almost no windows. Uh, you know, what's, why windows? Uh, you know, I don't know. But, but anyway, you, you see that these are small uh, houses. This one was actually a little bit smaller, 850 square feet. Frank Espinoza, his wife Salome, their daughter Adila, their son Gregory, their daughter Francis, their daughter Esperanza, and their daughter Castilia. Along with Jesus Negrete and Juan Robledo in this house. I suppose they didn't do all that voluntarily. You suppose that if they had greater financial resources or greater options, they might have done something else. But this is, this is how it was. So far as I can tell from the records that survived, Mexicans in early Granella, as interesting and maybe surprising as it might have been for people who lived here in that time, did not enjoy the same regard or well-being as white foreign-born. Although the city newspapers regularly reported on the travels, awards, and acquisitions of white Grinnell, I don't know whether you've ever read this stuff, if you read the, the Grinnell Herald and so on, I agree. I mean, they knew in the paper about almost everything that anybody did. You know, so-and-so got a new chair. Um, you know, that kind of stuff was in, you never read any of that stuff about the Mexicans in town. Uh, maybe they didn't get any chairs, but I mean, truly, their, their, life, their lives had important things uh, in them uh, as well. Mostly, we read about them in the paper for instances of misbehavior. Now, here are just a few samples uh, that show up, and you can, uh, you can look through these at, at your leisure if you want some entertainment. Um, there's a lot of talk in these days about prohibition and so on. Uh, what eventually comes to be a prohibition movement, so uh, bootlegging was uh, of interest. There was a front page report of a knife fight between two uh, men, whom the paper says both Mexican. They want to make sure you get that uh, get that point. Uh, and then there was another case that reported 11 Mexicans charged with breaking into freight cars to steal numerous and succulent watermelons. <laughs> to satiate the cravings of Mexican appetites. Well, um, I suppose the Mexicans weren't reading this uh, paper, but it does tell us something about the other readers, I think, uh, who might not have been terribly surprised at, at what, they, uh, what they saw here. So, uh, I think anyway, it's pretty clear to me that the Mexicans were perceived as different and they lived more modestly than other foreign-born. Um, we could go through more of the cases of where, where others were living in some, but these folk were living either in, in railroad cars or in the, the spec houses that I showed you and so on, were living in very cramped and difficult, uh, difficult circumstances. The interesting thing about this, to me, is, nevertheless, the Mexicans were officially often described as white. In the kinds of, I mean, you think, well, this goes with it, you know, lump them all with the other people who, who uh, merit a designation as color. The 1915 um, census, I told you it's made up of cards. Uh, this is one of the cards, so here, uh, these were, uh, there were, Four, I think it was, uh, clerks who took the whole record. This is one man by the name of Thackeray, did this one out. So here's Fidencio Estrada, who was 23 and born, you see, in Mexico, uh, Catholic, lots of other stuff. Can you make out what's written here? It's 
written very faintly, but it says white. White. Born in Mexico, but white. Now, this is even more remarkable to me when you read about Peter. Uh, the factory had some troubles with spelling. There are often some interesting things. I guess this says Markopolis, something like that, a Greek name. We know that he was born in Greece. It says right here. Can you, can you read this one? It was first written, there's the B, it was first written brown. And then you see someone checked this out with a big W. The records were being entered into a, I don't know, register of some sort. And someone says, brown? We don't have a category for brown. W, white, right? And you'll see several of these, if you go through the records, you'll see that several of these were corrected on their way to the, to the ultimate destination. But Thackeray, Thackeray was saying, well, you know, Mark Hoppus, he looks kind of dark to me, uh, brown. Not black, not white, brown. Uh, on the other hand, here's Rebecca Ramirez. Now, uh, she's 30, what did I say, 30 something over there, eight, is it? Um, also born in Mexico. And here we've got another recorder, a man named George Murray. George Murray, uh, I don't know what, he, he took a look at Rebecca and he said, dark. Do you read that? Dark. D-A-R-K. And here's someone else says, oh, geez, you know, they can't ever do anything right out there in the field. I got to correct that. Uh, but but it, it, why do I point all this out? Because color, the way in which people perceived color was itself so viscous and, and fluid and, and imprecise and vague. Right? We want to, the, the official reports want to say, well, you're white, you're really great, you're not, you're not so great, and so on. But it turns out there was, in fact, this kind of uh, oscillation that made it hard to know uh, what kind of color we're talking about. So who had color in, uh, in Grinnell a century ago? The 1895 uh, Grinnell census uh, counts 25 people whom it identifies as colored. But that's exactly the term that we use, color. And the first word had zero. Uh, but after that, the second word, which, you know, is uh, the boundaries change a little bit over time, of course, but what we're looking at is primarily, uh, was that southwest, right, Grinnell? The other side of, of West Street. Northwest. 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 Okay. <laughs> well, actually, well, okay, yeah, okay, Northwest. Third word and fourth word. 25, all right, almost nobody. Another way of thinking about this is, from the point of view of this census, Grinnell was 99% white. The 1915 census, uh, if you look at the totals reported for the, for the state of Iowa, declare the state of Iowa as being 99.3% white. And uh, everybody else, almost nobody. Kawashi County in 1915, 99.8% white. I mean, really, really, really white. Uh, I don't have the totals for Grinnell for the very reason I mentioned to you earlier. The, the file, if you go through the file, the, the summer report, Grinnell was too small a town to count that sort of way and give you the kind of totals. And if I use the raw data, I don't know how many people I'm really talking about. But I think it's safe to say it was also really, 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 really <clears throat> so, what did it mean to be black, then? Here's Eliza Craig, uh, interesting person, 73 in 1915. She was born in slavery, uh, eventually made her way uh, here. Uh, her father intervened in order to try to uh, give her life of freedom and so on. And she marries uh, George uh, Craig and settles here uh, in town. Um, Thackeray, who was doing the recording here in 1915, had no trouble deciding that she was black. Right? So uh, that's, uh, th those are the folk who count of color. And here, one of, if I have the time, we'll talk about a series of these families. There are several others whom we might mention, but there's not quite as much to say about them. I was just talking about the Craigs, right? Uh, William Good, so far as we know, in his time in Grinnell, he lived with his mother for a while. Uh, bachelor of we won't have as much to say about him. Mumford Holland, I want to talk about. Uh, Nelson uh, Hudson was in and out, but his family was here for a long time. The Lucas family uh, had several branches that were very important here in town. Uh, Redrick, 
uh, many of you know about the Renfro's, and then of course the Tibbs family. Some of you, or, or maybe members of your family, went to school with some of their uh, some of their offspring. George Craig. The Craigs, uh, at least for a time anyway, lived at this house on Second Avenue. And I'm sorry, I don't have any older pictures of these places. These were not the houses for which you normally got historical photos. Uh, they weren't the places that were thought to be memorable and, and archived and so on. So we don't have uh, historical photos. I think this is probably pretty much what the house was like uh, at the time. It's fallen into disrepair. You're going to see that some of the other houses are today in much better, uh, much better uh, condition. According to the assessor's record, today's assessor's record anyway, says the house has about 842 square feet. For most of their time here, George and his wife Eliza, or Eliza, as some of the time called, uh, lived here uh, together themselves and occasionally one of their, uh, one of their several daughters lived here. Uh, George was also born as a slave in Kentucky. He reaches Iowa in 1860, marries around 1866. As I said, he lives as a barber. She is listed in the 19 census, 1900 census as a washerwoman. If you're, uh, the barber, the number of the African Americans in town worked as barbers, and I think that's a very interesting thing. I've never thought about it before. I don't know why that's so, but somehow that seemed to be an occupation that was okay uh, to do. Um, and uh, I mentioned their daughters here, and one of the reasons I mention it is because they, the, the African Americans in town married. Uh, to, in, how do I want to say this? They they married across one another's families. They, they they weren't so much searching in other towns and so on. They were actually marrying other African Americans in Grinnell. So in a way, they created a kind of society. They were related uh, to one another as well as living living close to one another. <clears throat> Mumford Holland lived in this uh, house at 511 uh, Second Avenue, and this is one of the houses that's undergoing quite a bit of renovation. It looks very attractive now, it has a garage at it and so on. Um, but uh, it's also a fairly small house, 840 square feet, according to the current assessor's uh, record. But for uh, Mumford Holland, this is a photo of some of you who have seen this photo at other times. Um, for Holland, it was probably good, to, and we know that he lived there from at least 1908 until his death in 1916, so he lived there alone. So 840 square, not, not bad at all, I would say. Uh, for, for him. But Holland was a kind of special case. He had also been born uh, in slavery, and uh, he had gone to war with his uh, master, both the Mexican uh, War and the Civil War. Uh, after being uh, captured, he uh, enlisted, I guess is the way to say that, in the Union Army. After the war was over, he was mustered out at, at Davenport, and in 1871 he was brought to Grinnell. George Christian uh, was a local hotelier, I guess you would say, uh, and he brought uh, Mumford to town to help him out in his uh, business, and later Mumford was invade, engaged in some other things. Uh, some of you will remember uh, some photos of him driving a, uh, a cart, uh, kind of a somewhat deficient horse, evidently, through town. It, he was uh, living out on his own, uh, his own sense, I guess. In any case, he died in 1916 uh, at that spot we were talking about. And there was uh, an obituary about him in the newspaper. Uh, Mumph, as he was often called, people didn't call him Mr. Holland or Mumford Holland and so on, Mumph. Uh, he was uh, uh, made familiar in that way. Uh, the newspaper called him uh, a Negro typifying the best qualities of his race. There's that word again. And what were those best, best qualities? Faithfulness, industry, and affection. Um, <clears throat> always, the paper went on, there were the same quaint stooping walk, the same deferential greeting, the flash of white teeth from behind the gray, woolly beard. This is uh, kind of conventional stereotyping, I think. Um, Deferential greeting, I, you know, you talk about all those masters, think about Robert Coots, for example, you know, the successful uh, mason in construction. Do you suppose he walked with a stoop? Do you suppose he had a deferential greeting to people? Uh, or was that a kind of legacy of slavery, perhaps? Or a legacy of the way in which uh, Holland was treated in town? Um, 
we don't know the answer to that, but uh, you're, you're... Anyway, furthermore, the uh, obituary concluded, everybody teased him and joked with him, and he expected and liked it. I doubt it. I doubt it. But it fits, doesn't it? That, that kind of statement fits with an assumption that we are taking care of these people, right? And if we make fun of them, well, it's all in good, good spirit, and so I'm living in a big house and he's not, so I've got this kind of job and he doesn't, so, but you know, he loves it. The John and Lucas uh, family also is a rather interesting one. For a brief time, they lived at this house on West Street, uh, I don't know whether they lived there alone. It's, it's still standing, and it's not a small house, about 1,400 square feet, according to the uh, assessor. But uh, very soon they moved into the house that Mumford Holland had occupied. Holland dies in 1916, and at least by the 1920 directory, the John Brown Lucas family is living in this house. Maybe earlier, but I'm not sure quite when they moved in. Um, and uh, that, was, uh, that was kind of significant. John Brown Lucas, his wife, together with their daughter Martha, her husband, Percy Smith, and their daughter, Anna, all lived here in 1920, 840 square feet. And, and the fact that he was born in 1861, John Brown. Yes, he was named after John Brown, the, uh, you know, the incendiary, shall we say. The, the, yes, I mean, he was, a, a, well, in fact, he was celebrated for a time as, uh, it was alleged, I don't know if this is ever proven or not, that uh, he was the, uh, how would we put this, the oldest living black man born in Iowa, I think that was the way it was put at one time. So, uh, yeah, and he ends up, by the way, his family, some of his family ends up in uh, California, he dies actually in California, stopped in California, he had two daughters, I think it was, who were living out there uh, at the time. Uh, John Brown himself, for a time, he did all kinds of different work, so he was in and out of uh, in and out of town. Some of you, uh, I didn't know about this, Buxton, I guess, had been a big mine at one time. There was a big settlement there, and, and uh, in some way or another, of uh, blacks, and as well as, yes, miners and blacks. Uh, and so he was living there for a time, but after 1919, certainly, it uh, was here. The Renfro family, about which uh, maybe more is known than some of the other families, uh, lived at 411 First Avenue. And this house, too, has gone through a lot of uh, renovation, and I think it looks quite lovely. You can see there's lovely uh, gardens that have been done. I don't know who, who lives there now, but uh, it's quite a nice, uh, quite a nice place. Um, it, it's described today as having more than 1,200 square feet. I don't know whether that was true back in their time uh, or not. Uh, the Renfros had five children living with them at that time. Uh, one of their children, uh, Rebecca, I think it was, had had some sort of mental uh, problem and lived in the, the record for the census says she was living in an institution for the feeble-minded in Glenwood, which is up, where is that, Mills County, I think it is. Uh, so she was not living with them, but still, this is a pretty big houseful for a not very big, for a not very big family. The, the Renfros turn out to be quite remarkable in many different ways. Mrs. Renfro, as I mentioned before, was a Craig, right? Uh, she, she, she was the daughter of George and Eliza Craig, so again, we have one of these marriages that uh, crosses the boundary. Uh, but their six children were quite remarkable. Many of you will know that Helen, who I believe was the valedictorian of her high school class here in Grinnell, went on to become a hematologist at uh, Iowa City, and there is now still, I think I'm right about this, uh, a, an elementary school in Iowa City named after her. Helen Lemmy, it is, it was her married name, L-E-M-M-E, the Helen Lemmy Elementary uh, School. Um, Alice Lee uh, became a librarian at the Library of Congress where she worked for 40 years uh, and left quite a legacy. Uh, there are records there of uh, all that she did. Uh, brother Paul James worked for the Postal Service. He also lived in D.C. Edith, uh, some of you will know about, worked for the Art Institute and is commemorated here, graduate of the college. Evan L. ended up in Savannah, Georgia, married a carpenter, it was, and Rudolph, who lived in D.C. for a while, eventually moved to Norwalk, Connecticut, and became a financial advisor. So a lot of really great things happened uh, within this family. Uh, I'll have more to say about that if I, if I, get, the, if I get time to do so. Oh, 
the Robert Redrick uh, family for a time lived at this house, 721 Center. Uh, Center Street, you know, I, I, this was, uh, I made lots of wrong turns and I was trying to track these things down. Center does not go through, right? It runs dead into the railroad and stops. The, the old maps make it look as though the road did cross over there at one point. It no longer does if it ever, if it ever did. But this is the house where the Redricks and their daughter eventually married James and Oscar Tibbs. And so the Tibbs family lived there. So again, we have one of these cases of the families uh, marrying and uh, staying, uh, staying there. Uh, current assessor's records show that this house has about 900 square, square feet. Uh, Robert uh, Redrick was uh, born in Florida, uh, born in slavery, I believe. By the 1880s, we know him as a servant to uh, George Christie. Remember I mentioned him before having brought uh, Mumford Holland to uh, town. Uh, the record shows all these people who were working for Christian, and one of them uh, was Robert, uh, Robert Redrick. Um, at least by 1894, he's living at this address. Uh, he's listed as a laborer in 1905. He's described as a carpenter. He retired in 1910 and dies very soon thereafter. Um, his daughter Mary is the one who marries uh, James Oscar Tibbs. Tibbs was born in Missouri after uh, slavery, after the Civil War. Uh, did a lot of different jobs in 1915. He was in Lemoyne rather than here in Grinnell. But by 1920, he's here, married, and they labor on the city, uh, city streets. And uh, their children, some of you will have known uh, their children who grew up here. James Oscar himself died in, uh, in uh, 1941. <clears throat> when uh, Tibbs died, he also heard mention in the newspaper. 8 uh, January uh, 1941 describes Jim as a humble character. He shines shoes, and he shines them well. Who shall say that a man who shines shoes for a living is not entitled to as much credit as a man who fills a more important position? Well, that's a noble thought. It's a noble thought, but uh, in fact, a lot of people in Grinnell thought that uh, they would say that he didn't deserve uh, more attention, because the article goes on to say, this is a little bit like what happened to Mumford Holland, I can't help but notice. The boys used to make a lot of fun of Jim. He was the butt of innumerable practical jokes and he didn't like it very well. If you're still taking notes on what to put in my obituary, not this. Right? Not this. He used to get mad and the madder he got, the faster came the jokes. Now the article goes on to say, well, I'll bet you that down in his heart he really liked it. But maybe not. Right? Maybe that's why he got angry and why, uh, why he was uh, as annoyed as apparently, uh, as apparently he was. Is the fact that that's, an obit that that's 1941, does that mean that, that we're moving a little? Uh, or whatever. Uh, I would hope so, but I don't really know very much about it, so I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to punt on that one. Whether 1941 means that, that, that there was a... Uh, some change in, in over the course of time, whether attitudes in Grinnell have changed over the course of time, and I've punted on that one, and uh, I don't know. I want to try and see if I can hurry. I'm almost at the summary here, so we can, uh, we can I hope, still have some time for, for uh, questions or comments. So, uh, what, how to add all this up? What was the meaning of race and color in Grinnell a century ago? Well, in one, whatever it is, hour, a little over an hour, we had, we're not going to solve all this. We're not going to get all of this uh, down. But it seems to me pretty clear from what I have talked about that early Grinnellians understood there was some difference. They, they were not content to say, oh, well, we're all the same and it's all just... A, there was difference. They recognized it and they gave voice to it. True, as I said before, this perception was often vague and confused. Remember my discussion about the census, who was colored, who was not? who was foreign, who was not, think about the Mexicans as opposed to the others. There, there seemed to be a lot of uncertainty here, which only proves, perhaps, how much of a social construct this was rather than, than anything else. Nevertheless, and I think this is important to observe, particularly in the context of today's events, we were talking about at the beginning of the hour, this perception seems to me clearly influenced reality. The kinds of jobs that people fulfilled, the income that they brought home, if you want to go through the 1915 census, it, it gives what people report as being their income. And I can tell you that 
many of the people we're looking at here got very little income. Um, it made a difference. Housing, social life. Um, Alice uh, Renfro, whom I mentioned a moment ago, was interviewed some years ago by a Grinnell College student who wrote a history of African Americans at the college and in town. And uh, Alice, who did, also did very well at Grinnell High School and so on, did the secretarial course that she was a very good typist and so on. But she went on to observe that, nevertheless, uh, even when Grinnell Club was hiring, needed a lot of help and so on, even when the washing machine was hiring, they needed a lot of help, none of those industries hired us, she meant herself, the uh, black uh, Grinnellians. And uh, when we look at some of the, some of you will have seen uh, pictures like this, this is the, uh, everybody who worked for Grinnell washing machine, I forgot what the year is of this picture, it's, you know, it's a huge crowd of people. Um, go through it sometime with a magnifying glass and find, if you can, any evidence of color. It's hard to escape. I say, well, Grinnell was more than 90% white. True, but not any uh, example of, of color. Alice, uh, Renfro said, among other things, we could go to the theater in town, she said, I, I've never seen this written anywhere except what she reports, she said, we could go to the theater in town, but we had to sit up in the balcony. All right? I mean, I, I don't know, was there a sign? How did, how did that, but, but uh, that's what she reported. Candyland, um, what was it called then? Candyland, in the only an ice cream emporium in town, the predecessor, I'm not talking about the, the current thing. The, no, I mean, I mean Candyland. Uh, at that place, according to Alice anyway, they refused to serve her ice cream. All right? I don't, I don't know, was there a sign out there? I'm not sure, but uh, just uh, lest we get too comfortable thinking about how this, uh, how this, might, have, uh, how this might have happened. So, uh, the perception also fed the characterizations of people. Who was worthy and who enjoyed being the butt of jokes? The explicit recognition not only of difference, but also of hierarchy. So, what's the take home, according to me anyway, what's the take home message here? In the context of today's discussions about immigration and race, we haven't really talked about immigration, but there's a lot out there, isn't there? What we should be doing about people who arrive in this, are, this town dependent on immigration. Evidence from early Grinnell reminds us of the endurance of perceived difference and its consequences. What's harder, it seems to me, uh, despite what I think a lot of people think are the easy answers is what's to do about it. Uh, one thing, of course, is to deny difference. And there's something about that that appeals to me. I've, I've studied enough, I guess, 18th century history to think that I would prefer that we spend a lot of time emphasizing, emphasizing what we share with one another rather than what distinguishes us from one another. That's one way to look at it. But uh, it's, it's alternatively, uh, as, and maybe more popular uh, presently, is to assert difference. That is to say, to take your identity from exactly that difference. What it is that distinguishes me from you becomes the way that I can actualize myself. And I, I, I understand something about that, but uh, also, also worry, worry about it. The uh, kind of catch phrase of our era, perhaps, is to embrace diversity. And, and again, I sympathize with and uh, support the idea on the other hand, it's, it's, uh, it's hard to think that this is going to be the answer. And you don't have to go very far, and certainly not very far in history. Uh, think about the Bosnia in the 1990s and so on, people who shared an awful lot, who were able to find just those little slivers that were enough difference in order to kill one. Uh, or Rwanda, or other cases that we might bring. So, uh, yes, embrace diversity, but if you start recognizing difference, then what do you do with it? How do you, how do you get your arms around it? And it's not uh, obvious to me how that, how that happens. But I'm going to leave it at that. Thank you very much. We still probably have time for a question or two. Yeah. Uh, were the schools integrated? Yes. Um, uh, I'm, going to, I'm going to talk about the schools actually next week okay. a little bit, and we'll get some sample of that. Okay. Uh, they're, they're not, again, there are not many instances, but they, yes, there are. Yeah. Uh, are the, I'm sorry, I didn't phrase this, uh, rephrase you. Are the schools integrated? And the answer is yes. Religious differences. Are you going to talk about that? In your uh, next time, uh, let me see. Next time, you got to come back. <laughs> next time, uh, I want to talk about the church and religion for half the hour and schools for half the half of the session, whatever it is. So, uh, 
uh, schools will be a part of Tibbs. Don graduated without a Tibbs. And, and Don graduated without a Tibbs here. So we see we've got the connection connection right here. Uh, all the way in the back. Blacks were not issued a birth certificate by the government and it would be interesting to know if they didn't consider them enough of a human being to be registered. Uh, the, 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 the question is uh, asserting that the blacks were not issued birth certificates by the government and, and did they count as uh, human beings. Uh, I don't know that that's the case. I, I know that um, it was Nelson Hudson, I think it is. I have his birth certificate. Uh, he was born in Missouri. I don't know whether it makes a difference or not, but I have the register of his, who his parents were, when he was born, where he was born, and so on. But whether was that common? I don't know. I, I haven't really looked into that, so I'm not sure about that. Yeah, money. I think I'm correct, but the chair in which people sat while they had their shoes signed by Mr. Tibbs is still at the headquarters barbershop. Is that right? The, the, yes. Bonnie was saying that the chair in which uh, Mr. Tibbs did the shoe shine and so on is still in the headquarters barbershop. I'll have to take a look at it. Uh, I haven't seen it. Yes, I'll come back. You suggested that if you had time, you might uh, elaborate on the case of, was it, the name was Field, was it? Who, oh, yes, Frank Field. Field. Yeah. Uh, uh, the question has to do with Frank Fields and how he ended up in, in Fort Madison. Um, he was accused of and then confessed to rape of uh, an African-American girl. Uh, and he served, I can't remember now, I think in 1940 at least, which was the last census year, he was still in Fort Madison. So he served a long spell, and I don't know what happened to him after that. I don't think I found his, uh, his death date. So. I worry you out. Oh, one more, one more question. Yeah. Not a question. I just wanted to make a statement. Okay. <clears throat> I lived in Newton in the 50s, and there was only one black family there. And the father was an employee of Fred Maytag. Uh, uh, what's your name? I'm sorry. Donna Winburn. Donna Winburn lived in Newton in the 1950s. Uh, it was just one, is that right? One uh, black family in Newton who worked for, uh, and, and men worked for Maytag. And there are still descendants living there, and some of them have been good athletes. Some descendants still living there. Yeah. Oh, great. Well, thank you so much. You've been very kind. Thank you very much, Jan. I think you heard yourself a good math this afternoon. <laughs> How did this work out for you this morning? Are you comfortable enough? Just glad to be here. All right, we'll see you all back here next week with Ed Kaiser. Thank you for coming. Oops, I'm sorry. How about you?